Thank you very much for the introduction. Welcome everyone to the presentation. So today I'm going to talk about making our data uh, fair. In this presentation, I want to uh, first give you a little bit of introduction, and then I want to look at the fair principles from two perspectives. First, from a very high level perspective, as you very often get to see in many presentations in which you have to explain in five minutes what fair principles are to a layman. And then in the second part of the presentation, I want to go into each of the principles and sub principles and show some examples of how to interpret them and actually what you can do to make your data fair. So the presentation will be, will be kind of a mixture and I hope that everyone will be able to find something interesting for uh, themselves. So even if some part of the presentation suddenly is not clear to you, you can wait you know, a few slides and you can always catch up because the topics will be uh, changing uh, pretty fast. So let's start with the introduction. And um, I don't know how many of you remember this great talk at TED, uh, which was almost 15 years ago. This is one of the best talks on TED ever. It's about the visualizing uh, statistics made by Hans Rosling. This is a talk in which he's explaining um, how you can uh, visualize the data and how people are missing uh, skills to interpret the data correctly. You might remember the talk because he was uh, comparing his students from Karolinska Institute to, to, to monkeys, and then he was saying that the monkeys are actually better in interpreting data than the students. And this is not what I want to talk about today, but uh, he, in his talk, he touched some of the points which are quite important nowadays, actually 15 years later. And one of the things he said that the problem in, in doing the statistics and understanding what's going on in the surrounding world is because the data is hidden down in the databases and we are not using it effectively. And he says that you can find the data on some web pages, but you, have, you very often have to pay for it and there are stupid passwords. Uh, so when, even if you find the data, you, don't, you cannot really access it. And I have two more quotes from him. Uh, so what he says, what is needed, what kind of change we want to do is that we can put the data into a searchable format so that we can easily uh, navigate for the data. So it's not only that I find one spreadsheet and, and that's it, but actually I can look inside of it easily. And, and he claims that there is a lot of publicly funded data and uh, it's crucial to make them searchable. In, in the current language, in the language of fair principles, we would likely say findable as well. But this is something he observed 15 years ago. And in the meantime, there was the movement of making things fair, making things open, and so on. And that's why I'm standing today in front of you to talk about fair principles uh, of how we are trying to solve such problems, similar problems, because I guess all of you are familiar that these challenges exist on a daily basis in all domains of research, whether it's computer science, psychology, chemistry, or Earth observation. So in a simplified way, uh, you might have seen this carton already before. Fair principles stand for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So the first part is you need to be able to find the data. So you need to be able to uh, uh, you need to be able to find out uh, that actually the data exists. Once you know that this data exists because you found it, you want to access it. So you want to know, for example, uh, you want you want to be able to let's say put your hands on the data, meaning if somebody keeps the data in the basement which is locked and you don't know how to open this basement it's not going to work. So you must be able to look at this piece of paper that you just found. And then the interoperability, which is uh, very often a problem, problematic for people to understand what interoperability means. From this cartoon, you can see that once you found the data, once you access the data, once you have it in your hand, you want to know how to open a specific file. You want to know what is the language that was used to uh, to write the sentences on a piece of paper you have found. So interoperable basically means 
that you are you know how to read what you have found and what you keep in your hands. And then reusable is that you can you you have full rights to reuse the information you have found there. So you can produce new uh, data. You can produce derivatives of what you have found, and you are allowed to it. And basically, if this uh, Piece of information was made reusable from the very beginning, uh, you uh, have no problems in achieving, in finding it, accessing it, and interoperating. So, uh, being able to open it and, and, uh, and navigate through the contents. This is a simplified uh, view on third principles, but there is a way, there, is, there are much more things to, to consider in making uh, uh, data fair. And this is another diagram I have found on the internet. And this one goes a little more, a little more into the details. So it breaks down each of the principles into the sub-principles. So for example, it says that to make things findable, you need the PIDs, you need metadata. It has to be indexed in the, in the data repository and so on. We will go for each of these later, but this is just to show you that the way we talk about the fair principles in our community differs so sometimes the explanation as i have presented in the first slide is good enough sometimes you need to go a bit deeper in case you have questions uh, and in case you have doubts of on how to interpret the uh, principles i recommend you to look at the original paper from 2016 uh, in which the principles were defined because currently we have so many presentations and so many tutorials, like the one today, <laughs> trying to explain you what fair principles are so that uh, you can really get lost. And, and sometimes not everything, uh, what we say as a community overlaps. So as a sanity check, always go back to the original document because uh, I would say this is the ground truth for the uh, fair principles. If you want to have this information, uh, let's say, in an easier to navigate way with active links and more examples, you can also visit the GoFair website where you, where you will find the contents of the original article. And these are the primary resources I have used today for um, creating this presentation, plus, of course, some examples that you will see that come from our experience here at the Center for Data Management in, uh, in Vienna. Before I jump into uh, discussing each of the principles, I just want to clarify one more thing about fair and fair, one written with capital letters and one written lowercase. Uh, this is sometimes confusing for people coming from different uh, scientific communities because both of these words uh, recently have uh, quite a high popularity. So, Fair principles have nothing to do with algorithmic fairness. These are two different things. To be fair, uppercase means to apply and use fair principles. And the focus is on how to manage the data, how to prepare the data for publication, uh, how to use present identifiers and things like this. Fair written in lowercase is about how we design systems. And this is a focus on implementation it's very often used now in connection with uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning. And here we're talking about evading bias. So for example, creating algorithms which are not trying to um, discriminate people because of their ethnicity or social status and so on. So in this presentation, we are talking about the fair principles and we are not dealing with algorithmic fairness. So let's take the first principle and analyze it a bit. So for each of the principles, I have examples, uh, simplified examples, uh, which try to illustrate what is good and what is bad. Uh, I hear a question. Sorry, this might be a problem on my end, but can everyone else hear Tomasz? It's a good question. So can you hear me or am I talking for eight minutes? <laughs> okay, yes, okay. Hmm, I have the same problem and so now I'm lost. Yes means that you can hear me or yes is that everyone has the same problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, everyone can hear me. It seems like only a few of you have a problem. 
Good. Thank you very much. So, uh, findable example for findability. So, a rule of thumb, and this is why it's called a simplified example. If you put the data into a data repository, like the one provided by an institution or a catch all uh, repository like Zenodo, or if you publish your source code on GitHub, your data is findable because it's in a resource which is publicly available using identifiers. If you put the same data onto your personal website, or if you keep it on an FTP server, it's not really findable because, for example, your personal website is not optimized for search and for search engines. And if something if somebody makes a simple Google search, they won't get this information easily. Maybe it's linked from your paper, but this requires somebody to read your paper first. Uh, if your personal website is down because you change your affiliation, the URL may be broken, not a good idea. FTP servers, especially nowadays, finding them on the internet, I wish you good luck. So a rule of thumb is public repositories which are meant for uh, sharing data make things findable. Things like personal websites, FTP servers, some custom platforms for sharing, not really. However, uh, if we talk about accessibility of what it means to, to whether you can access the data or, or not, uh, FTP or your personal website makes things accessible because once you know where the data is, and if you go to this website, you can download it and the conditions for downloading are clear. So if it's publicly available and everyone who has a link to your FTP server or to your personal website clicks on the links and get it, yes, it's accessible, but you're failing at the findability. Uh, good examples here for accessibility are all kind of open data portals where you get the immediate access. But also if you have restricted uh, access to data, but it's clearly defined how to get access, it means that your data is also accessible. So here we have an example of a, of a data set on the left hand side with a restricted access and there is a button where somebody must which, which which somebody must click to explain why they want to work with this data this also fulfills the requirement of accessibility what is not accessible uh, in turn is for example data on a usb stick that you have in your drawer so if you have a friend living in a different country different street or, or, or some other let's say random researchers they cannot access the USB stick in your in your drawer. The same is with uh, using the uh, passwords for the uh, zipped uh, uh, files, because sometimes you you find the data you are interested in, you find the file and it has a password, and you don't know what the password is. And, and sometimes it's like you thought that the password is needed, but after some time, you know, half a year later, not anymore, but you forgot about the fact that the password exists for the zip file. So you give the zip to somebody else and they cannot access it. So this is not really accessible because there is no clear way for somebody who gets the zip file on whom to ask to get access to the file. If always a zip file would have be, would be shipped with a readme, okay, if you want a password, you can do this or that, that's kind of fine, but that's not really realistic that you will always ship these two files together. So uh, USB sticks, passwords on, 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 on zip files, not a good idea. Open data portals or portals where you can uh, request access and provide a way to request access, make things accessible. Interoperability, uh, here, it's, here we can have different uh, shades of gray because you can think of an XML file, which has some structure and XML files are commonly used by many uh, tools to, to model data, to, to exchange the data. But if you have an XML file, which uses concepts from a well-defined schema, uses concepts from some standards, or there is an XSD schema defined for it, it's perfectly interoperable because people understand the meaning of specific entities you use in your file, in the encoding of your data. However, if you just come up with your own custom XML where you're using some 
um, custom invented names and attributes that are not following any standard, any controlled vocabulary, are only understandable by you, this is not interoperable. So this is, an, uh, this is a, a principle that people very often say, if you're using uh, common formats or open formats, you're interoperable. This is not entirely true. The fact that I'm using an XML, a JSON, a CSV, doesn't make my file, doesn't make my data really interoperable. The contents of the file are important. So yes, use an XML, but then make sure that everything inside can also be interpreted by, by others. Another example I have uh, is about the proprietary formats. So of course, if you have, for example, MP3 for audio recordings, it's the fact it's a de facto standard and every modern equipment, every computer notebook can, can uh, play the MP3 and it's, it, it's basically, because of its popularity, it's interoperable. And if you use something proprietary like M4P, which comes from Apple for audio recordings, then basically only people with Apple devices can uh, open it. And again, if this is okay for your community, because you're only exchanging data with people who have, who have Apple devices, that's fine. But I guess this is not the case. You want to aim for the maximum interoperability you have. And if there is a de facto standard like MP3, you should go for it to be interoperable. More discussions on interoperability in the second part of my uh, presentation. And the last principle in the simplified view, reusability. So if you find data and if you want to use it for your own experiments, uh, and if you want to basically have confidence that the data you have found makes sense, you want to take it from a trusted source where you have permissions to use and uh, where each of the um, data fields has well-defined meanings and you, you, have, you have really confidence in, in what's in there. And in this example, I have data provided by the uh, Statistical Office of, of Austria, where a lot of work is done in data preparation, cleaning, and, and the validation before it goes on the website. And as a simple contrast to such a trusted uh, 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 source, uh, I have some uh, cloud uh, providers that people use for sharing data, like WeTransfer or, or Google Drive or Dropbox. Uh, yes, you can find data there, which you can reuse, but the question is always on the provenance and permissions to, to do so. So if somebody gives you some link to Google Drive and you see just a bunch of data, some numbers, can you trust it? Can you reuse it? Not really. Of course, if somebody made a nice work of documenting and together with the data, you find the license file, you find a good uh, documentation and then you know the person who gave you the data because in this case, this person vouched for the quality of the data, then that's fine. But the rule of thumb is if you have a trusted source, it's reusable. If it's just a random link from some data sharing platform on the internet, it's not really reusable. So these are the um, fair principles in a very simplified view in a nutshell. And before we jump into the details of the fair principles, I would like to uh, show you three slides on machine actionability. Because machine actionability is core to fair principles. The, the fair principles, the way I explain them now in this first part, were from the perspective of a human, from a perspective of a researcher, what fair means to humans. But if you read carefully the original paper and the principles, it's very often stressed that fair principles require data to be machine actionable and all these descriptions must be machine actionable. So let's check what this machine actionability really means. And here I have uh, two definitions, one which comes directly from the fair principles. Uh, the capacity of computational systems to find, access, interoperate, and reuse data with non or minimal human intervention. And the second definition I have from the um, DDI uh, vocabulary, information that is structured in a consistent way so that machines or computers can be programmed against the structure. 
And I think the second um, second uh, definition explains a bit better what machine actionability actually is. So we must ensure that not only people can interpret what's inside of the files, but also the machines. Let me give you a specific example. We have a PDF uh, file on the left-hand side, and this PDF file uh, con contains a table with some uh, temperature forecast for Galway in Ireland. So we have three days of a week and we have temperature, the lowest temperature for each of them. You look at it, you know exactly what's in there. But if you were to write a program, a script, which gets information from this PDF, this would be a lot of information, a lot of, a lot of effort. Because on one way, you could try to use some uh, text recognition algorithms, which by default is not a straightforward, straightforward thing to do. On the other hand, you could try to navigate through the structure of the PDF document and to identify that there is a table and that the table has rows. And if you know exactly what you're looking for, you would be able to get this information from the PDF. But this would be quite a lot of work. And for this reason, this is not really friendly for the machines to, to, to get the information out. You cannot write a simple query like you would do for databases, for example, give me the temperature in Galway on Saturday, 13th of November. This is not really easy. However, if you have the same information as a CSV file in which you have the values separated by, by comma, this is something you can see on the right hand side. I have opened this CSV file in, in Excel, but you can also edit it in, in any other editor. And this shows you exactly the same information as the PDF, but writing a simple script that gets this information, what was the weather on Sunday 14th November 2010, is very easy because the, because the data has structure, because the data doesn't have all this uh, overhead of the presentation of the, of the PDF that the PDF must encode in, in itself. So very often the publishers of, of journals and other uh, of data repositories, they tell you, if you provide a journal paper uh, as a PDF, please provide all the data in the tables that you use in the journal as machine actionable formats so that people can later do something with the data, they don't have to type it manually back into, into Excel. So if you want to quickly, for example, uh, calculate what was the minimum, maximum, and, and average temperature, you do it with two clicks. You don't lose time on converting the data from one representation to the other. So this is the first example of machine actionability. And the second one I have is with the use of linked open data and semantic web technologies. So the same information you have on the, on the weather forecast in, in Galway in Ireland can be, can be expressed using uh, concepts from uh, controlled vocabularies. So if you look at the example um, in the second line, you can see that the temperature is two and it's, uh, and, and it's, and it's exp expressed in Celsius. So using well-defined ontologies, well-defined um, concepts like the concept of Celsius, you can even give more information to the machine on what's in the data. Because in the previous slide, you could see that uh, we know that the temperature is in Celsius because of the information in brackets in the header of a table. Here, this information is explicit for each of the measurements directly, uh, directly next to the measurement. So we know that two and four and seven are decimal numbers. And we know that each of them is Celsius. And because of this relation is meteor temperature off, we know that this is a temperature measurement and not something else, not, not a different type of measurement. And each of the locations, in this case, Galway, is also defined as a, as a specific location. So we know it's Galway in, in Ireland and not in Australia or Canada, if any of this exists. So there are uh, dedicated lectures on semantic web technologies. I don't want to now go into the details and explaining of how to use it, but basically the key message I want to give now is that machine actionability has also different levels. So you can start in a very practical way from by using 
for example, CSV instead of PDF to store the tabular data. But if you really want to make it actionable, you should uh, machine actionable. You should uh, focus more on the semantic web and, and lit open data concepts. So as a summary for this part, uh, fair has to be um, making data fair means making it fair to people and also to machine. And the more machine actionable data is, the better it is. Because the easier it is for somebody to analyze the data, to interpret the data, and in turn to reuse the data. And the picture I have shown in the beginning with the simplified view on the fair principles was focusing only on the human aspect and the machine is not in the figure. So that's why it's sometimes it may be misleading and, and you cannot only perceive the fair principles as making things fair for people. Remember also about the machines. Okay, let's go in the details. Uh, if you look, at the principle, uh, the first principle on findability, uh, it consists of four sub principles. The first sub principle tells us that we must have a person, person identifier for our data and metadata. The second one uh, tells us that we should collect metadata together with data. The third one tells us to include the identifier directly in the metadata, and the fourth one to put data and metadata into a searchable resource. And now I want to go for each of these sub principles to give you some examples on what it actually means. So let's start with the first one, with the person identifiers. And here I have an example from the real life. Uh, I don't know how much you are into the cars, but, but basically every car that is manufactured is getting a VIN number. Uh, which is which stands for the vehicle uh, information number, I guess. And this is this kind of a sticker you can see here, an awesome car and the, and the number. And this is a unique number for the specific car that left the factory. And it's somewhere under the hood or next to your door, I guess. And this stays the same for the whole life of the car. And the car can have many owners and the owners can uh, be from different cities, different states, and they may be changing the number plates. And this is something that uh, changes over the lifetime. And this is the same with the data and with people. Data is produced once only and it should get a person identifier. And where you keep the data, whether it's in repository A, B or C, can, take, can change over the lifetime. So that's when the URL changes. The URL is like a number plate for the, uh, for the car and the PID is like the VIN number uh, for the car. And here are some examples of uh, identifiers which you can use uh, to make your data fair. So on the one hand, you can use an identifier for people. So it's an ORCID ID, which is assigned to a specific Person, this is a, a landing page for uh, myself. You can see the number 000, 000, 002, and so on. And anytime I change my employment, I go to work somewhere else, I keep my uh, ORCID identifier. So even if I change my affiliation and I keep on writing papers, all this information will appear in my ORCID profile. You can also assign a DOI, uh, digital object identifier, to publications. And I guess this is the, the, the most common use case you are familiar with. So you can see that here is a screenshot of the first uh, page of a paper. And this identifier is included twice. It's included already in the paper. So when I find the paper, I know what is its identifier. And in turn, if someone has the identifier, it should always resolve to this paper. But the connection is like bidirectional. The, the identifier points to the paper, but the paper also has it explicitly mentioned what's the, what's the identifier for it. You can also assign uh, DOIs to code. And here you have two screenshots showing how this has been realized uh, on GitHub. So on the left-hand side, you can see a, a source code repository with an information that this specific uh, revision of the, of the code has a DOI. 
And on the right hand side, you can see a copy of this of this source code in Zenodo with a link to the GitHub repository. And it shows you that this source code has this specific DOI. So whenever you get a DOI, it will take you to the, uh, the to the data repository where you can find the code. But from there, you have this big button called GitHub, which will take you to the code repository where you'll find this specific revision, but maybe also newer versions of the of the software. So you can identify people, uh, publications, code, and of course you can identify the data. So this is an example from a data repository of the Teuvin where you can see a landing page for a data set. And on this landing page, there is an information on the DOI uh, for this uh, data. So in case this data would be moved somewhere else to a different repository, uh, the DOI will be updated and you will point to a different repository. But this DOI stays forever with this specific data set. Uh, now uh, I have uh, four other, three other uh, principles, sub principles of findability. I want to illustrate with with an example. Uh, I have um, there is a there is a repository uh, from the Climate Change Center Austria, in which data sets uh, related to climate change in Austria <laughs> are published. And it, here I, I have an example of the. Uh, Rockfall source areas uh, in Austria. And one of the principles, uh, sub principles, says that you have to put data into a resource that is indexed and that you can basically search for it. And this is an example of how to, how to um, solve it. So if you put your data set about the Rockfall into a, a data repository that can be searched. So here is a result of, of searching for. Rockfall and can return relevant ideas for the person who was searching. Then you are in such a uh, in such a uh, then, then this then this sub principle is fulfilled. Uh, then the next sub principle says that metadata clearly and explicitly include the identifier of the data they describe. So this is a landing page for this Rockfall sources data set, which you can see here under the resources marked with the red frame. And this landing page also contains the identifier. In this case, it's a handle, so not a DOI, but handle is also uh, one of the person identifiers. So you clearly have in one place the link to the data set, date, metadata, and the metadata include the information about the identifier. This was the same case as I was showing for the uh, for the data repository, for the DOI assigned to the data repository, to the to the object in the data repository of the Wim. And one other thing I have here marked with the red frame is that you can export metadata, and this metadata is also available as machine readable or machine actionable metadata. So it's not only about providing all this information in a human readable way, but also in a machine friendly way. And the F2 sub principle uh, data are described with rich metadata. This is one of these obvious sub principles. So, in this, uh, in this screenshot, you can see that you have this Rockfall sources area file on the top. And then you have metadata and you have specific tabs. So, you have tabs about basics, keywords, spatial, time specifics, quality, conformity, and so on. And in each of these tabs, so basically in each of these categories, you have fields. Uh, which are populated with values. So here we can see the abstract of the data set. We can know that the, that the, the data set is in English, what is the license, that the uh, data set is public, and everyone can use, can use it without any, any limitations. So this is the metadata on the data, and this is how you can realize it. So as you can hear from what I'm saying, using data repositories, in general helps you in achieving the, the findability in, in making data uh, fa fa fairer or, or more fair. And just to, to follow up on this example, uh, the previous metadata I have shown you was kind of defining the basics. So we're focusing on who is the author and what is the, the license, but what a rich metadata, and this, this is now the focus on the richness is that you provide something more, you provide something domain specific. 
So in this say, in this case, as we are looking where the rocks were falling, it's really useful to have a bounding box presented on the map so that the users can identify, okay, this data set is specifically for this area. And then they know, they know whether it's useful for them or not. So rich metadata means not only just the obligatory basics which the DOI meeting committee requires you to provide like author, title, license, and, and who minted the DOI, but really something more, something that can be uh, of use to your uh, peers. And if you don't like the example from the uh, rocks falling in Austria, uh, let's look, have a look at a different domain. In this case, there is an example of metadata in the chemistry. Uh, this is taken from the NIH and you can see here only metadata registered. So here we have information about ethanol and uh, you know, we have the properties of ethanol. We have um, different representations using inch keys, for example. We have the molecular formula. The repository itself doesn't have uh, a sample of, 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 of ethanol. So in this case, ethanol would be, would be the data and everything you see here is the metadata. Sometimes it's just enough to register the metadata into, into such a resource. So whoever wants to get information or ethanol can look it up in this data repository and then the information on methanol is findable. So these were the examples for findability. And let's talk on accessibility. I think this is the easiest principle to explain, but also the one that is causing quite some confusion. So for accessibility, we have two sub principles. The first sub principle says that the protocol to, all, to access the data is open, free and universal implementable. And the word protocol sometimes is, is not well understood by people. So protocols, on the internet protocols in let's say computer networks define how we can exchange information, how two devices can communicate. And that's why I have put here a picture of this OSI model, which is used by network people to describe different layers of communication and how and um, to, to identify the requirements for two devices to, 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 to talk to each other. But for the, for the end users, it basically means that you don't need to have any fancy infrastructure to be able to access the data. So as now basically every computer is connected to, to internet and we are using the, a well-defined set of protocols that you don't even know of very often, this is the thing to use. So nobody can require you to uh, make an investment to, uh, put an extra wire into your house and then pay some fee and then buy, buy some uh, fancy devices that only one manufacturer in the world produces to get access to information. This is not an open and free protocol. As long as you are using, for example, HTTP and HTTP we are using to access web pages, this is fine. Uh, and this is it basically in this, in this principle. So this principle doesn't tell us that we must make our data open. It's about the protocol being open, meaning we should be able to use our computers connected to the internet to access the data. Uh, the A12 sub principle says that uh, the protocol must allow for authentication and authorization. And this one says that private and protected data can also be fair. So yes, we were providing quite a lot of examples in which data was made immediately available because you were going on a website to a repository, clicking down one button and getting it. But it should be also possible for people to restrict the data. The data may remain private and when, when only the owner has access, but as long as the information on the on the internet, let's say, exists, that this data exists and that somebody may get access or that people will not get access because, for example, somebody's privacy must be protected, then it's fine. So protected data, restricted access, it's also compatible with FAIR. 
And of course, if there is an authentication protocol, for example, you must create an account and log in first to be able to download data. This is perfectly fine and you can do this to make your data accessible. So examples. An example from Zenodo or from any other repository. If you go to a repository and search for um, uh, for data, you can find that most of them are published as open data, but there are quite some closed, restricted, or embargoed. And all these closed, restricted, and, and, and embargoed are also compatible with fair principles. This is something I uh, explained already before that if you need to have this restricted access, there should be a clear way to uh, request access to this uh, file. And if you fulfill the criteria, well defined criteria, not just whether I like you or not, but actually, you know, it should be kind of clear why somebody is eligible to get access and why somebody is not, then uh, realizing accessibility with such a request access button is uh, perfectly okay. Um, so something I'm uh, stressing quite a lot in here is fair data doesn't mean open data. This is a common misconception stemming from these first uh, sub principles about the openness of the protocol and not openness of the data. Fair data can be open, but it has nothing to do with the A1 sub principle. And remember that access also has to be um, provided to the machines. So yes, uh, all the examples were for humans, the way we perceive it, that we go to a landing page, we find the data set, we request the data, but all this discussion can also happen on the, let's say, machine level. So there may be, for example, HTTP APIs, or so-called REST APIs, there can be Sparkle endpoints for uh, linked open data, there can be some client libraries in you know, Python, Java to access data on the remote servers. And these are also perfectly fine ways to access the data. And if the data is accessible, it means that, for example, it's only accessible if you connect to an endpoint using a set of, of libraries, which are defined uh, what kind of libraries you must use. So access is not only click to download where you're going, going on the web page, but access can mean connecting, uh, using infrastructures, writing a script, writing a program, using some uh, custom uh, library. Um, and the, the second sub principle of accessibility, uh, it's about providing information on metadata, even when the data is no longer available. These are the so-called tombstone pages. So if you have a data set, which is in a data repository, you gave it already a DOI, you provided the metadata, and then you realize that there is a mistake in the data or that some data was published when you had no rights to do so, or there are some privacy concerns and you have to take the data set out of the repository. You cannot simply delete the data and think like nothing happened, but uh, you have to create a tombstone page. So this is something the repository would usually do for you. And this page will explain that such a data set existed at a given moment in time, and that it's no longer available and it would provide some simple explanation why somebody cannot access it anymore. And uh, very often the metadata will stay if there is no problem with metadata, but only the object, the actual file, the actual data set will be removed. So deleting data, yes, it's possible. Deleting data is kind of okay, but you must clearly mark that this happened and why this happened. Okay, so we're halfway through for findability and accessibility. Now let's talk about interoperability. And here the interoperability consists of three uh, sub principles. So the first one focuses on the language for knowledge representation, that basically we have to represent the concepts in a way that everyone can understand. The second one says that we should use vocabularies that follow fair principles. So basically, I will my presentation I will focus on 
what, what the vocabularies are and why we need them. And the third one says that we should provide qualified references to other data sets, to other metadata, which allows us to better understand what this specific data set is about. So let's start with the first one, the I1. Uh, the principle says that data should be readable for machines without the need for specialized or ad hoc algorithms, translators, or mappings. And now you should remind yourself what I said about machine actionability, that PDF was not really machine actionable and CSV was. This is exactly the case in here, that if you don't have to come up with any fancy uh, processing pipeline to get access to information and it's relatively simple, then it's also fulfilling this recommendation I want. So if you are using common formats like RDF, like JSON with schema, like XML, or anything else that is popular in your uh, community, and the file format which is popular in your, in your community, that's fine. If you use a CSV file, but provide also a good reading on what are the names of the explaining what are the name, what are the column headers you are using, how to interpret them, perfectly fine. It's I will repeat, it's again not about just using some specific file format but also about explaining and understanding the contents of this file format. Here I have an example of the, uh, from the chemistry. In chemistry, uh, the community is using so-called entry keys. So this is this, this random string you can see at the bottom of the slide, this IDGUIHH. This is a, a standard to encode information about chemical uh, particles. At school, you were uh, taught, for example, that water is H2O, and using Inchi key, this representation would be completely different. But the community had some reasons to make this uh, encoding much longer to be able to uh, maybe include all types of particles and also to make it possible to interpret by the machines. So if you are creating an CSV file and XML file, a JSON file, which is describing things about chemical particles, it's important that you also use these inchi keys inside of the file, and then the language for knowledge representation will be understandable to the community, will be understandable to the machines, and this is fine. But if you just create an XML or JSON or RDF or whatever kind of file, which is an open file format, but then you write in your own words and let's say you write it even in, not in English, but in another language like water or, or, or a name of a chemical substance, which may be ambiguous. This is, doesn't really help in the interoperability. Of course, to some extent, yes, but not as good as it can be if you followed a known representation. Um, the second uh, sub uh, principle of interoperability uh, says that we should uh, use vocabularies, common vocabularies, controlled vocabularies, uh, you can also call it dictionaries. Uh, and in general, vocabularies help you evade ambiguities. So a common situation you might have had before the pandemic was my plane lands in London. And what it means it lands in London, which airport? As you can see from Wikipedia, there are six airports in London, which are you know, several kilometers away from, from each other. This is not a very precise statement, my plane lands in London. And for this reason, the International Aviation, International Aviation Association uh, came up with a list of, uh, of, of acronyms for airports, and each of the airports has an acronym, like in London Heathrow has an LHR, uh, and London City Airport stands for LCY. And if in your data you say instead of London, you say LHR, it's clear that you're landing on, uh, on Heathrow. And then, for example, it's easy then to suggest you what is the best way to commute to the city center in public transport. Uh, so that's the, that's, the, that's the value of having the control vocabularies in your daily life, but there's the same value for research data. Uh, if you're using the controlled vocabularies, everyone who is using this data later uh, is spending less time and money on, on, on data cleaning. Uh, 
So you don't have to align languages. You don't have to correct spelling mistakes. You don't have to deal with abbreviations or capital letters. So here is an example of from Wikipedia uh, about Vienna, uh, the city where I'm located. And this is Vienna written in different languages. And imagine that in each of these versions, you can have a spelling mistake. You can write, have it capitalized, all uppercase, only the first letter uppercase. So if you are supposed to work with this data, you are really lost if you would really have it in such a variety of, of representations. But if you just stay to one concept and you agree, OK, I'm always using Vienna in English as sitting on the left hand side, or if there would be basically a concept number, concept reference, a URI to the concept. It's much easier for processing later. So having some alignment, using some controlled vocabulary, using a country code, city code, this is basically what you what you want to have in your data as well. So some examples. Uh, here is the Uniprot uh, repository where you can find information about the uh, proteins. And in this um, landing page, this is some protein about cancer, antigen, whatever that is. It's a landing page for this protein. And you can see that this protein has something to do with an organism. And Homo sapiens is this organism. And both the um, metadata field and the value for this field are well described in this repository. So if I click on the organism on the left hand side, it's explained what it really is. So it's not left openly for the interpretation, but it's defined that it follows this kind of taxonomies and this is a, that this field provides a name of the organism and so on. And on the right hand side, when I'm providing a value, this is where the, this is where the controlled vocabularies and taxonomies come into play. I, when I'm selecting a human, I can actually see the whole lineage in human because somebody already made the hard work of breaking the breaking down the hierarchy that, for example, human is a mammal and, and, and so on, and it's in the Homo sapiens uh, family. So I'm not typing any free form text. You know, instead of writing human, I could write a person because I don't know, my English is not very good. And I'm using a different term and person and a human is the same to me. So why not type a person? I'm kind of forced to select uh, one specific value from this hierarchy. And then we have also a better consistency of data. And it is good if such controlled vocabularies exist in specific domains. Of course, the main challenge is that this is not true for all scientific domains. So here in the, in the biology, as the research on, on, on organisms has been going for centuries, we have very nice and well-defined taxonomies, but in other uh, domains, this is not really the case. Uh, qualified references is the last sub-principle uh, of uh, interoperability. Um, here you can see an example of, uh, again, of Uniprot, where we have the information about the specific protein. And then in one of the sections down on the website, there is a section called cross-references. And here you can see, for example, mRNA translations of this protein. I have no idea what this means, but it's clearly uh, of interest to people in this domain to see how this specific protein relates to other, uh, to other uh, particles or how it can be actually expressed using different standards, different, um, yeah, different modeling uh, techniques. So this is a very important uh, thing to, to provide, to provide the context. If we go back to, uh, let's say, other domains, like I can give an example from computer science. If I have a, a publication in which I'm claiming that I have written some source code and I made some experiments with this source code on the data, it would be good to have a link to the source code and to the data from my publication. And also when I have my source code, it would be good if the source code would link the, the paper describing what I did and the data I have used. So doing this cross connections between different artifacts of, of, of research is what this uh, principle is calling for. Okay, so uh, the last 
principle, uh, the last five principle, reusable. Uh, this one uh, focuses mostly on good metadata and documentation, licenses, provenance, and community standards. Let's uh, check in detail what is required to make your data reusable. So the first one says, metadata are released with a clear and accessible data usage license. And this is a very important thing because if you don't have a license and the data is available uh, for people publicly on the internet, they can look at the data, they can look at the, at the code, but as there is no license given, they have to assume that maybe it's not allowed for them to, to, to use it. So a good example of the source code repository is GitHub. Everyone who puts the data on GitHub into a public repository is usually willing to, to, to share the code with others because otherwise they wouldn't put it there. But people sometimes forget to assign a license. And then basically this means that there is no possibility for use. Others can only view, view, the, view the code, they can admire it. Uh, and this is only allowed because the terms of use of the service actually enforce that. And you know, code without license is like an object in a museum. You can watch it, but you cannot touch it. And this is a problem because we want to reuse it, so we want to touch the objects. And if the data of the code is properly published, like you can see here in the, in the source code, uh, there is a license file added to the source code. Uh, then the, the GitHub will dis display you that there is actually a license which you can which you can access, you can read. The license comes from a well-defined uh, uh, license schema in this BSD uh, license. So this is well understandable for, for people in this domain, what actually you can do with this code or what you cannot do with the code. And, and this, is, this is really essential for everything you, you publish. Same applies for the presentation I'm giving today. If we uh, publish this uh, presentation and we intend to publish, we should clearly um, um, indicate uh, what are the uh, permissions for use of this public of, of this presentation. So we should embed information, for example, that it follows the CC BY uh, license or, or, or some other license. Currently, it has no information on this. So even if you get the the, pub, the, the presentation, you really don't know what you're allowed to do to do with it. The second sub principle of the reusability uh, says that the metadata are, or, or data are associated with detailed provenance. And provenance itself is a synonym to provenance is lineage or origin. And provenance describes where the data comes from. And provenance usually answers questions like who created the data? In what way was the data created? Was it uh, I know, a question, or a survey, a, a simulation? You made, you made up the data, when did it happen? So how old is this data? And, 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 and on the methodology of, of doing that. And here I have two examples uh, from the politics. So uh, you know, officially North Korea claims to have identified zero cases of COVID-19 inside of its territory. Or you have Donald Trump claiming that he won the elections by a lot. And of course, these are some statements you can see, and you can uh, cite the article, you can cite the tweet, you can use this information to, to build your opinion of the world or to use it in your investigations. But the provenance tells you uh, whether you should fully trust the data you have or not. And that's why provenance is, is critical for, uh, for reuse. If you don't know where the, the information or the data comes from, Yes, you may reuse it, but then you can, this can basically lead to some um, uh, bad reasoning or some mistakes in, in what you will um, identify in your research, in your research outputs. It may, it may basically lead you to, to wrong conclusions. And uh, last but not least, we have the sub principle uh, that metadata or data must meet domain relevant community standards. And this is a very uh, hard recommendation to give one specific answer, what it means to, to fulfill this recommendation. Because the first question is who is the community? And the second one is what is the standard? 
uh, because if you're doing research in a very narrow field, the community for you can be the five people in the world who know what you're doing, but there may be a broader community of another 200 people in this field of uh, science, which can also understand uh, what's going on. Uh, what is the standard is also a question. Is it, for example, is English a standard or, or maybe French or, or Spanish are standards in, in other uh, communities? So here we have to be very careful and you have to really have a good understanding of, of the research, of, of, of types of data you're producing and who is potentially trying to use it. And then prepare the data in such a format that people would, would, would use it. Uh, if we're talking about the metadata itself, uh, something I have already um, touched upon when talking about the rich metadata is that you can provide metadata, which is domain independent, like, for example, Dublin Core or data site where you're focusing mostly on what's the title, who's the author, what is the license. But you can provide also the domain specific metadata, like there was this bounding box for the Rockfall uh, sources in Austria. Or here I have an example of an exit for images where you're providing uh, specific settings of your camera if you're sharing pictures of if you're sharing uh, pictures with others. So here you can see what's the exposure time, what's the ISO speed rating. This may be very relevant for uh, people in your domain to provide this domain specific metadata. And again, it's up to the researcher, it's up to you to identify what is the, uh, what is the common way people would like to, to see, to get this uh, information. And very, very often, there is no common standard to, uh, to provide this information, to, to, to provide both, to prepare the data according to the common standard and metadata. And that's why having a good documentation and a good readme file is always the, the answer. So let me give you three examples. Uh, the first one is from the uh, musicology. And you can think that uh, the, the tonal scale that we are using here in Europe that you all learned at school that there is do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. But this is a common way to encode music. No, it isn't. There are other uh, tonal scales used around the world. Here you, have a, here you can see a comparison of tonal scales uh, used in uh, Southeast Asia. And if you say in Southeast Asia that, uh, that our Western scale is the standard, people will not be very happy to hear that. Don't, don't try to do so. So you have to be really careful to whom you talk. The same uh, is in, in music about using the German and Italian uh, terms, because for example, the German terms focus more on the technical aspects of the playing music. Well, the Italian terms uh, focus more on the emotions uh, which you have in the music. And it's really hard to translate one uh, standard into the other standard, and very often they are used in parallel. Um, another example is from, from computer science. Uh, in computer science, in software development, there are many domain specific conventions on how to use specific frameworks, there is this famous fight between people, whether you should use a tab or, or, or spaces. Uh, and uh, sometimes yeah, there are jokes that you will not get hired if you're using tabs or, or spaces. And, um, and again, the choice of a programming language is also sometimes a factor. Because nowadays, if you're looking for Python or Java developers, you have, let's say, plenty of them. Uh, and it's and it's come perfectly fine to share the code in Java and Python, but what about the old languages like COBOL? This is not a standard to to if I share a program using in COBOL with my scientific community, people will not understand it. But if you go to any of the banks and you 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 talk to the mainframe operators, you will still find there quite many people who actually use COBOL who understand COBOL. And then this is perfectly fine to, to write code in COBOL and share it with them. So you, you really have to have a good understanding of, of who is your community. And the last example that emerged during COVID, and this is something that I think all of you have encountered, there were always problems in uh, communicating statistics on the COVID cases. And it was always a problem 
whether uh, the, the values on, on COVID cases which were reported, which, are, which were provided as news to you today, whether it's about the cases, whether it's the reporting date today or the reporting date of the cases from three days ago, whether it's the date of taking the measurement or whether it's the date when the result of the test arrived. And since there was no common standard to, to, to express this information, the only way to, to share the data in a meaningful way was to provide a good documentation. So here you can see a, a screenshot from one of the agencies in Austria, which was providing this data. And for each of the metadata fields, they have a very good readme. And they were explaining, for example, that the reporting date of the case is what you will find in the data. So it's not the date when the test was taken. And this was this is this was the only way to, to solve this uh, problem of publishing data, of making the data reusable that people can understand and trust and, and, and to be used in their own investigations. And this is it when it comes to the five principles. We've made it through all of the principles and, 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 and sub principles. So as a summary, uh, one last slide before we start the Q&A. Uh, all you should know is that there is no silver, silver wallet that makes data fair immediately. So if there is anyone who comes to you and tells you, yes, you buy this product and all your, fair, all your data becomes fair, no, there isn't something like this. It's always a, a composition of, of actions. And making data fair is a shared responsibility between infrastructure operators and providers and management, because researchers can only make their data fair if there are services that allow them for it. So you must have the PID services, we must have the data repositories to put the data into them. So this is the responsibility, not of the researchers to run data repositories, but of those who can fund that and who can operate that. Research communities in turn, so not the individual researchers, but groups of researchers, they must agree on the common vocabularies, on the standards, on models, how to represent the data, how to exchange data. And this requires this collaboration like within the GoFair or our other projects to, to define what is the common language we use to make our data interoperable. And of course, the individual researchers then must use these standards, must be aware the standards exist, must prepare the documentation if, if needed. And in general, they must manage their data because if they don't do anything, their data won't be fair out of the box. And don't forget about the machines. Human aspect of fair principle is important, but making sure that uh, machine action, that all the information is machine actionable is really essential. And this is what will enable this digital transformation that we are all aiming for in Europe. Thank you very much for your attention and let's go to Q&A.